We're trapped in a dark attic with the furniture piled up all over the place and we're crashing into it all the time. You know, that's our mental state when we start working on ourselves. And then we get a headlamp and that's psychotherapy and we can begin to look here and there and begin to rearrange the furniture so we're not tripping all over it. But then, you know, these spiritual practices show us the doorway out. Welcome to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel, a podcast that illuminates the path to collective healing at the intersection of science and mysticism. In his conversations with visionaries, innovators, artists, and healers, Thomas invites guests into a relational experience that allows inspiration and innovation to emerge. This is The Point of Relation. Lama Somo is an American Lama, author, and co-founder of the Namchak Retreat Ranch, specializing in Tibetan Buddhist wisdom and meditation. Born into a Jewish household, she became a Lama in Tibetan Buddhism and is fluent in Tibetan. She is passionate about educating young people and supporting positive social change. She holds an MA in counseling psychology and has authored two books about Tibetan Buddhist practices. Hello and welcome. My name is Thomas Hubel. This is The Point of Relation, uh, my podcast, and I am so happy to be sitting here again with Lama Tsomo. Lama Tsomo, warm welcome. So happy to be here, Thomas, and speak with you again. Mm, yeah, we had a lovely conversation for the last Collective Trauma Summit, which I really enjoyed, and there we thought, okay, it would be great to continue the conversation. And I think we have many fields of resonance in common. We are deeply interested in healing, we are deeply interested in spiritual awakening and, and social impact. So I think we there's a lot of overlap, and uh, but we're also coming from different backgrounds. So let's, let's uh, feel into maybe how different languages, different traditions look at very similar things in their own specificity. And so I think that's a great chance. I think it's a great chance too, because um, you know, if you see only with one eye, then you can't see 3D in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. But if you have two eyes that overlap their vision, then you get 3D. Mm, that's a nice metaphor, actually. It's lovely, lovely. Yeah. So let's say, I mean, one one whole field of exploration that fits kind of to the eyes is the wisdom traditions talk about relative truth and absolute truth or some traditions talk about um the very specific and the very universal and mm -hmm. how they're interrelated and the different ways to express maybe the same thing and um and so maybe you can share a little bit and then i will chime in uh how this appears in my work but then maybe you speak a little bit for our listeners, what's the difference between relative truth and absolute truth? And how does it relate to when you look today at our world and uh, how we see dynamics in our world? Where is the truth here? And <laughs> so, <laughs> let's speak a bit about that. Yeah, so um, going to the metaphor of the ocean and waves, which is very popular in Buddhist circles, um, it's a good way to talk about the two truths because we can look at it from the point of view of the waves that are on the surface of the ocean, or we can look at it from the point of the view of the depths of the ocean and you know the vast one ocean versus the many, many waves. Each wave is unique and the ocean just by its nature plays <laughs> and creates making waves. And the Tibetans even talk about it uh, using the term ropa, which means play. Um, so in its creative play, it makes all of these individual unique waves. And every one of us waves is made of ocean. So somehow we, uh, as a human being, I think we need to find a way to hold both truths at the same time. But we're fascinated with the truth that has to do with just the very tops of the waves. And from that point of view, we look uh, like we're all just different. And uh, there's me, and there's you, and there's other people, and so on. And that's all we can see. We can't see that we're all made of ocean, 
and that there's actually one mind that's suffusing all of us, all of this. And first of all, there's uh, that's a tragedy because of our feeling like we've wandered away from home for a very, very long time. And there's a part of us that just yearns to go home. And that certainly has propelled me on my spiritual path. Uh, and I think for many other people, though they may not express it in that way, but the other tragedy is what we're seeing right now in the world, right? So you're sitting in a war zone. Um, I'm not in a war zone, but I'm Jewish. And my granddaughter's about to go off to college. And on college campuses, there's a lot of harassment of Jewish people and so on. Meanwhile, um, many of us Jewish people are furious at Netanyahu for some of his decisions. And so there's all of this strife on the level of the choppy waves, you know, and that's real too. We can't let go of that reality um, and just dive into the depths of the ocean. Uh, a friend of mine uh, was on a Zen retreat uh, with a great um, Zen teacher, and she was very much in the ocean part, you know, and she comes to him and she says, it's just, you know, ultimate truth. That's all there is. And he said, really? And he grabbed her nose and pinched it really hard. And, and he said, how about that? Said, oh. <laughs> oh, yes, relative truth. <laughs> so I just uh, am still in the afterglow of this wonderful experience I've had with uh, Sangha. So uh, we just graduated a three-year course going from people walking in off the street, not knowing really how to meditate necessarily. Some of them did a little bit and some of them didn't at all. And they went through a whole, progress, a whole progression of practices. And we also studied practices uh, for Sangha, for community. And that's part of our program. So that thread ran all the way through the program. So when things came up, and by the way, they came up in the graduating retreat, uh, the ending retreat as well, I found myself having to apologize because that's a big practice. So it's not just saying, I'm sorry, but saying, I feel where I stepped on your toes and I regret that. And I'm really curious to know how can I do better and bringing my curiosity and my compassion to them. And of course, we ended up with tears and hugging and feeling much closer. And so that kind of thing went on through the three years, as well as other practices for beloved community, as Martin Luther King called it. And so by the end, um, there was such profound connection among us. And they are going to continue as a Sangha. They have to. I mean, they have uh, bonds that are too precious and so many things in common and so on. And they've felt the power of practice despite COVID happening all this time. So then when we got to sit together after all this time and really meditate together, everybody was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> this is palpable. That we can come into a different space when we make a tide together that we can all ride in group practice um, and we get to a place we can't get to on our own cushion at home. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. I'll, I'll come to the group part in a second. I'll, I want to zoom in a bit because I think that's for all of us very important, the relative experience and the oceanness. So let's first talk about if, if somebody's starting point is my perspective on life mm -hmm. so where or how how does somebody get a taste of the oceanness of their being and so what are maybe also stages like from having a first taste to being more and more grounded in that sense so that maybe most of my day starts to happen as both and how did you see this in your own in your own sangha? Like how people get a taste? What is the breakthrough? How what practices are helpful there? Yeah, so most of it is gradual, and then you have these moments um, of breakthrough, and then you know regressing back into a more habitual way of seeing things. But the general trend moves uh, along the path. Uh, to being able to perceive not just the tops of the waves, but 
really the whole picture. So um, there are, I think, two categories of practices in Tibetan Buddhism, and they can get more and more strong and deep and, you know, stronger medicine, that kind of thing. But they have to do with seeing how we're not separate and feeling how we're not separate. Uh, and sometimes the practices will really join those two. Um, so the students were doing practices that did kind of both of these things. And it, you start with yourself, uh, certainly in the feeling how we're not separate part. We start with one of four what are, what are called immeasurables, or in Theravada, it, they're referred to as the four Brahma Viharas, and, or the four abodes. Um, and so these are compassion, sympathetic joy, loving kindness, equanimity those four. So these are four avenues by which we start with ourselves, compassion, loving kindness, and so on for ourselves, which is already hard for Westerners to do. Um, you know, this is going to take some getting used to. And um, actually the word gom uh, for uh, meditation in Tibetan means getting used to, <laughs> habituating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so they're aware of this and that's okay. You know, we do it again tomorrow, you know. Um, so we start with ourselves and then we go out to those close to us who we can easily feel is us, you know, and we easily feel compassion for them. And then we go out another step and another step until finally everybody is us. Mm -hmm. And this is extremely important because our brains are constructed so that we um, view uh, some people as us and some people as them. And so we're processing those two categories in two different locations in the brain. This is how we can do things that seem absolutely inhuman to other fellow human beings. And why I've always thought that the antidote to violence is empathy. Um, so I didn't know about the brain construction at that time. But so this practice uh, very cleverly redefines everyone as us because you start, you know, with me and you slowly go out, out, out until everybody is us. So there's an example. In how, how did you see in your practice the meditation practice informing our embodied experience of one another is that a sense that i have in my meditation and then i go back to live my life or do you feel that also the ways how people behave with each other the, how they relate to each other how they relate to the world to fragmented parts of society that it creates a sustainable kind of a more and more sustainable embodiment of walking how and how long does that process usually take I know it's different maybe from practitioner to practitioner, but do, is there some commonality that you see on the way? Is it completely individual, how you see the development? Well, there is a trend uh, among many people who practice this. Right. Uh, so it starts with feeling a difference the very first time you do the practice. And I've had people tune into how they felt. Then I took them through the practice for the first time ever. And I said, now, how do you feel? Do you feel any different? Well, they absolutely did. Um, and they felt this warmth and this expansiveness and um, warm heartedness and so on that uh, the Dalai Lama talks about. Um, but in um, rigorous uh, fMRI studies, they actually saw changes in the brain while the person was practicing for the first time. And then uh, within just a couple of weeks of practicing maybe a half an hour a day, um, there are carryovers off the cushion. So the brain changes carry over and you're actually, you, you're re rewiring yourself to meet life with compassion and begin to see whoever you meet as one of us. And then that just builds and builds, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. And so now when we have that practice, and let's say we all carry a certain amount of trauma where we all get usually triggered by other people, by groups in society, situations, 
and and then we feel either this outburst or we feel the distancing. So mm-hmm. how how does um, the compassion meditation, for example, influence me when I am in a relatively good state and I become more compassionate? And how does it affect those triggered places? To, yeah. How does your experience there? <laughs> Yeah, and I have to say, we do combine it with um, other practices that help us to see how we're not separate. And also, uh, all of these practices help us to loosen our um, you know, tight grip on ego and identifying as I. So as we loosen that, then we don't have to defend so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, there's this gap uh, so in shamatha practice, for example, when you've done that for a while, you begin to see, and again, this is in rigorous scientific studies, they have found there's this gap that happens between the incoming and the knee-jerk reaction out to defend. Rather, um, there's also a bridge then that goes to the executive uh, parts of the brain and the more resourced parts of our brains, including compassion. Mm-hmm. And we're able then to bring all of these resources to bear because we don't feel like, uh, you know, that fight or flight that's like defending to the death kind of thing. So we've got all of these resources that we're moving through life with over time, more and more, uh, to the point where when somebody, you know, comes at us with something intense, um, you know, which I have happened, of course, um, I found that I am uh, i don't just have to have the knee-jerk reaction. You know, those, you know, letting go of thoughts again and again on the cushion, I can also say, I don't have to be angry about this right now. It is just the same, exactly the same. And I've practiced it how many thousands of times? <laughs> Probably millions. So, because um, I, I have lots of thoughts on the cushion, so I have lots of opportunity to let go of them. <laughs> and so I can let go of that too, and I can still remain centered and able to uh, reach the more resourced and compassionate parts of my brain. So then I have a very different response. And I also want to say that we then go through life touching everyone around us and kindling them and their compassion because they have that too. You know, they're made of ocean too. (laughs) And compassion suffuses the ocean as a very, you know, essential quality of it, right? Ultimate compassion because um, the great uh, ocean of awareness feels every bit of pain in every single wave, right? Immediately. Right, right. Beautiful. And then uh, another question, like in in some of the mystical traditions, and I'm sure Tibetan Buddhism has an equivalent of that, we can say there are these four great states, like that I feel at a certain level of my practice unified more with the physical universe than with the energetic universe, than maybe with the formlessness. So that there are different levels how we feel unified with ocean. Yeah. Levels of oceanness, I would say, until maybe to we feel really or it's really non-dual. And can you speak a little bit to different levels of depth in the in the practice, in the meditation practice, how how that plays a role or doesn't play a role in your practice, whatever. Ah, um, my goodness. Uh, well, this begins to get into real Dharma discussion. And um, I am not a scholar, so I dare not go in that direction. Uh, my personal experience is that I do um, go into deeper and deeper layers of that experience to the point where... Um, I begin to perceive my own body very differently. Um, So, you know, it's really not so different from the way I've heard some physicists talk about, uh, you know, on the subatomic level, um, how it is. You know, there is no longer a clear uh, boundary between uh, inside your skin and outside your skin. Because when you get even to the level, level of atoms, 
the distance between the nucleus and the electrons, for example, is proportionally the same as between the sun and the planets of the solar system. So that's a lot of space, right? <laughs> Very little in between, right? So there's the occasional little, what we called particles, but then they've kind of ruined our understanding of particles because now, uh, you know, they found that when someone observes, for example, the double slit experiment, this famous double slit experiment, and they believe that it's actually light and not particles, then it behaves like light. When somebody believes they're particles, they behave like particles. Okay, so now you're getting to a point where uh, the mind is having uh, influence on how things show up and appear. And you can't pin down a particle for be as being exactly here. It's sort of in a fuzzy area that it could appear. Um, and David Bohm, the fam famous physicist, believed that um, there was this um, explicate order and implicate order. And the universe was going back and forth between the two constantly. So uh, this fits with what the Buddha said, that every like nanosecond, we are waves that are going down back into the ocean, and now it's just ocean and there's no form, pure potentiality. And then we emerge in form again. So like frames of a camera, one after the other, where there's nothing in between. And it comes up again and down and up and down. And we, our minds, because we're fascinated with the surface reality, make a continuum. But I have found in meditation moments where the, I, that slows down enough where I actually catch it between the frames, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm experiencing where there's really no difference. There's all that space and all these, what they called wavicles before because they were behaving like waves or particles. And, you know, it's your decision which. Um, and so, you know, that's really what everything is and me too. And so being able to get to that point, that's part of my own experience in pursuing this path for a long enough time and getting to some very deep and powerful practices. Right, right. Or when when observed as a wave pattern or when not observed as a wave pattern and observed as a particle, right, that... that and that what you describe is very beautiful because I also, in myself, obviously, but also many people that study with us, that uh, the similar the similar description that you said about this deeper expansion and that it actually slows down enough that very fundamental um, processes or aspects of life become tangible that usually uh, like happen in a fraction of a second they become more so this high resolution i think is beautiful how you described it and then um, when when we take this now to to the sangha or no i had one more question before right that when you when we look at what you started with a little bit with the nose that in yeah. some teachings or uh, for some teachers they the oceanness is the only thing, and mm. the the wave pattern, or mm. I would say the specificity of our expression, because the beauty is also that we both know about the oceanness, and we can feel it in the space, or we can feel it as space that is not divided, and at the same time, you do the work you do, I do the work I do. We can maybe find lots of exciting resonances and maybe I will we'll see also some differences but that's amazing and but if that drops away if you don't recognize the specificity then spirituality can also become like a bypass that is actually not fully touching real life the real marketplace conflicts like stuff that's happening in our world and yeah. Maybe you can speak a little bit to to how you look at that. I think that's very interesting. Yeah, it, it's so important uh, not to let go of either. So there's a famous uh, saying in Buddhism, not is, not isn't, not both, not neither. 
So we can't land on any simple way to hold all of this, right? All we can do is practice, practice, practice till we get used to it enough that we can begin to hold all of it at once. And I think of it as also being able then to um, finally find the channel changer and be able to change channels uh, when we intend to, and with grace. And I think that's what the Buddha did. I think that's what His Holiness the Dalai Lama is able to do. And that's what we would all like to do, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so these practices help with that graceful dance uh, when it's time to be, um, you know, in a very difficult discussion with somebody who's feeling very reactive and that sort of thing versus when we're, you know, sitting on the cushion with a bunch of other practitioners in complete silence and, you know, going to the depths and really kind of tuning in more on that level. Um, so, uh, but you can't fall into any simple answers or you're not going to have that uh, ability to dance with the entire breadth of reality. Mm. That's beautiful because... What you're also saying is what all the great traditions I think say, and you said it now in, in, in a beautiful description, not this, not, and so on, like um, how important it is to let go of the images that we carry of how it is. Yeah. You know, like how it is, and then we say, oh, no, it isn't like this, and it's both, and it's neither, and and the fixation of reality onto some form that we need to hold to, to turn reality into an object of consciousness. That yes. we view. And, this, and that's beautiful what you just said. I think that's very, very important. Um, yeah, so when I've come to the end of that and I realize that's not going to, I can't stand on that ground. It's going to get way underneath me um, because it does. It will regularly. And then we just keep doing it again uh, because we don't know what else to do. Mm. It's only through practice where we can begin to experience these different uh, levels and um, you know different realities, truly experience them for ourselves. We begin to be able to uh, stick a toe on new ground and begin to put a little weight on it. No, oh, okay, yeah, that works, you know. And uh, but so now we don't have to uh, be standing just on the one ground that's not going to really hold us. Um, this is the power of retreat, where you know that you're in it most of your waking hours. So you begin to get out of old habits and into new ones. You know this from language, right? Uh, when you were learning new languages, and I don't know how many you know, uh, being European, probably more than I do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyway, um, you know, I found in learning Tibetan, uh, when I immersed was the way I could really begin to think in Tibetan and had the rhythm of speech and it became fluent. And I could dream in Tibetan and so on. And it's the same with uh, getting out of our old habits of mind with, you know, the surface of the waves and being able to uh, get into different habits of mind. You need to do it all day long, it, you know, so you're constantly stretching that envelope and experiencing something different and beginning to, um, you know, say, oh, yeah, this is just as real. So the other thing that helps, and now we're getting back to it, is group practice, because, of course, when a group holds a reality together, um, then it's a very uh, quick and powerful way for everyone to help each other along to these other uh, states of being and ways of uh, seeing. Yeah, let's talk a bit about this. So how how is that held in the Tibetan practice? How much is the Tibetan practice, which is very old, based on, on group practice? And there's for sure lots of deep knowledge and wisdom around the power of group practice, Sangha, Maybe you can speak a bit how that's anchored in in a very old lineage. Well, it's uh, a fascinating thing. First of all, I'm an introvert, so I'm not big on groups. <laughs> <laughs> I grudgingly had to admit, oh my gosh, this is powerful. <laughs> and I don't want to miss out on this. Mm -hmm. And we do uh, several group practices within the uh, international uh, Namchak Sangha uh, that last a week. And um, the one way that they uh, are able to bring group, uh, everybody's awarenesses into uh, uh, coherence, 
is what I would call it, um, is through ritual. Because if everybody's chanting the same thing at the same time, and incidentally, just chanting instead of speaking already puts your brain into a different state. It opens up more of your brain and brings it to bear, and, and it coordinates the different centers. So now everybody's chanting together, and what they're chanting is visualizations that we all know, and they look the same for all of us, right? Mm -hmm. And we imagine ourselves as this um, enlightened deity, um, and we're all imagining ourselves to be the same one, right? And uh, first we invite the deity in, and then we uh, offer them this, that, and the other, and so on and so forth. And so we take our human minds that think in terms of inviting a, a special personage in and giving them wonderful food and drink and flowers and all these things. Um, but that's uh, the Tibetan way of taking you, meeting you where you are and then bringing you along to something much more profound. Uh, and we're all doing it together at the same time. So it's the difference between uh, ambient light and laser light. Ambient light, the waves are going up and down haphazardly. And with laser light, they're going down, up and down together. So that's why it's called coherent light. Mm -hmm. And it's obviously very powerful. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, how I can understand group practice in, um, you know, in its actual practice setting. Mm -hmm. And so I was describing a uh, drupchen or a drupchud, uh, there are two different varieties. And those were practiced in the old days until everybody reached enlightenment and actually reached rainbow bodies. So their uh, physical body was transformed into colored light. Mm -hmm. And that was witnessed by people and you know it's been written about and so on and recorded over time and actually it's happened in modern times as well mm -hmm. maybe you can say a little bit more about that rainbow body for people that don't know well i think it's basically enacting uh e equals mc squared <laughs> you know uh einstein was aware that you know energy light and matter were um uh, there's a way in which they're they belong in an equation together, <laughs> right? Now I can't speak on E equals MC squared much beyond that, but uh, the point is that again, we aren't we aren't made of something solid. Meditators have walked through brick walls. One of them uh, did that and was so he thought he could, you know, he was in uh, retreat and had that experience that I was describing of not being solid anymore and neither was the wall and so there was plenty of space so he could just pass through so he did this has happened actually many times but in this one case he got so excited he kind of went back into his old way of seeing things and he couldn't get back through the wall mm -hmm. <laughs> he had to go get help and they had to undo the wall why he walked back in and they did it up again <laughs> mm -hmm. so that's in modern times mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and a lot happened with the Tibetans who were imprisoned by the Chinese and, you know, things they did that made it clear that uh, what we think are the four elements and solid things are not that at all. They mm -hmm. were able to, you know, get beyond that. Mm -hmm. So um, that gives you a little bit of an idea, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, Rinpoche's teacher, his first real teacher in prison, Rinpoche got a fantastic education in prison, by the way, mm -hmm. <laughs> because he uh, was himself a, a reborn Lama. And um, so he got put together with all the worst threats to society, which were the other Lamas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, according to the Chinese, they were the worst threats. And so he got to study in secret. So they would put oil on a shovel and then sprinkle sand on it and then draw you know, the mantra or, you know, the visualization or whatever it was, and then mess it up. And now, you know, Rinpoche had it in his head, things like that. And so he was able to practice with this Lama. I had the chance to go to Tibet and meet this Lama. And it was shortly before he died. And when he died, they left his body in what is known as Tukdam, where it doesn't slump and it doesn't, um, degrade it doesn't smell nothing and it went on for many many days and finally uh his son could see through the crack uh that 
you know, Tupton was finished, there was no longer like this almost youthful glow about the body. It looked almost younger. Um, but what he did see, especially when he walked in, was that his father had um, let go of a lot of the matter and was now about this high. And, you know, perfectly proportioned, but this high. I saw a picture of it. Um, so, you know, this can still happen in these times. More difficult because we're in um, more, how can I say, ego clinging thick uh, times where there's a thick fog. Um, and there are sort of biorhythms of consciousness, ebbs and flows of it. And right now we're in a low tide, if you will. And that's why there is so much strife and so much refusal to even take care of our environment. So that we're like sitting on the end of a branch, cutting off the end of the branch ourselves mm -hmm. and not recognizing it, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, actually this was predicted by the uh, master who turned Tibet to a Buddhist country. He was invited there by the king. So it wasn't a colonial sort of... <laughs> Thing. Um, and uh, he predicted these times and the signs of these times, which we've seen, including pandemics, all the elements rising up against us, uh, global warming, it, you know, all of the things that we're experiencing, he predicted very precisely. And he also gave prescriptions for what to do. So we started a website called Saving Each Other Together, S E O T. Uh, so the SEOT project, uh, we can link that below, uh, is a website anybody can go to uh, to find out practices to do, uh, little uh, figurines you can uh, place in different places, uh, and all of these are part of the prescriptions to help turn things back enough so that we don't end up with nuclear war and complete annihilation of life on Earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow opportunity for about one year, by the way, according to that prediction. Uh, one year from now. Yeah, roughly. Roughly. That's the period. And, and after that, it's... Uh... It's just going to all play out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we can change the inner levels now. Uh, they're still flexible enough to change. So it'll just be horrible instead of complete, uh, ca you know, catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cataclysm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that website, we started that uh, about a year and a half ago. And so people can visit that. Mm -hmm. uh, but getting, I think we got a little sidetracked from group practice, maybe? Were we going there? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but on the other hand, it's very interesting. I like this organic unfoldment. And yeah. uh, they also, you said many, many very interesting things just right now. Let's let's go back for a moment to the group practice. And I know then you also have a practice for us to do together, for everybody who's listening. Um, I loved, in a way, and I will just say something, and then you can see if that resonates with your experience or not. So what I heard in the chanting, coming back to the chanting and inviting the deities and um, actually joining like an, an information that is a form inside of every practitioner that becomes more and more coherent. Mm -hmm. so, and what I'm saying is that when I look at you, I have Lama Tsomo in my central nervous system as a form, but in me, you are wave, your energy. Mm -hmm. But where you sit, you're a particle, you're a body. <laughs> so you're a wave over here. So everybody who knows us, everybody who holds a form of us inside is informed. Uh -huh. The information is actually a wave pattern. Yeah. Energy in movement. So everybody who knows us, so when you speak to a group of thousand people, then there are thousand Lama Tsomos. Uh-huh. All the wave fields. So you have there's a particle self, but there's also a wave self. And the more congruent or the more present we are, these are not two. They become very close, and they they lose their separation. And so, in a highly unified state, it's actually as you said, not this, not that, not both, not and 
And I'm wondering because when we when we work in Sangha or group, we actually all arise in each other. But I believe through the trauma, the separation, the past wounds, untaking care, shadows, we feel separate. And then the information or the intimacy is not that perceived. But what you do at the chanting is actually you you invoke a mutual way field that everybody can join in. Mm-hmm. And then it has a very powerful information. It's like you you are uplifted into that field. And mm-hmm. I think that's a that's a very lovely way to induce this experience of more unification. But it's actually something that in relational uh, deep relational presence is also happening to a certain extent. When we really attuned and feel each other, we have two forms that become very coherent. And I'm wondering if what I say, I said this now in my own language, if that resonates with your experience, if, if you would, mm. yeah, if you resonate with that. I do, absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of the famous uh, uh, Buddhist image of the moon. Uh, it shines on every body of water, inc- including a little cup of water, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there they are reflecting the moon. So the moon is in all those cups of water. And uh, I'm also thinking of the holographic structure of the, ourselves and the universe. Everything is a hologram. And so, um, you know, we are all in each other already, you know, uh, and it's just a question of which channel we're tuning into. So we have all of the deities inside of us. We are all of those deities. So then, of course, we can invite the deity in. Then we join with the deity. Now we arise as the deity. We play with that, you know. And then at the end of the session, um, you know, we just dissolve into the deep oneness underneath. It's formless. Um, But then we can arise again as another deity. And it doesn't matter if the deity is male or female and we normally identify as one or the other that makes absolutely no difference because we're all of them. Mm-hmm. So yes. I, when you were describing what you were saying, uh, you know, that's, I'm, you're not talking about deities, but it's still the same holographic principle mm-hmm. that we're tuning into. And we're using the power of the coherent group mind to access that. Yeah. That's beautiful because like one way I speak sometimes about wisdom is wisdom is how much of the world is included in, in the way we experience the world. And the more is included, the wiser we are because we are unified with more and more, but we carry all of that anyway inside. But it feels like we don't have sometimes access to these parts. And through the practice and the compassion practice, for example, is a beautiful practice to activate uh, that already existing universe in us, uh, or we and the unit that it dissolves the separation. That's beautiful. And um, so what else seems important for you in the group work? How do you experience, for example, interpersonal frictions that come up in the, you spoke a bit before already about it at the beginning, but maybe we, every Sangha brings up some stuff between people. And uh, I think it's interesting how we handle that stuff. Hmm. I have to say, uh, there was such resonance and such a uh, warmth and uh, a loving compassion in our group uh, in this last weekend um, that even though there was like one uh, kerfuffle, it, that was easily um, resolved and not even in the group setting. But there was still, you know, because we had all been doing these practices, both actual sangha skills and you know the on the cushion practices um it, we very quickly were able you know first of all as soon as somebody you know if somebody stepped on your toe and they say to you i'm sorry i realized that hurt and you know i'm thinking about you know how did i come to do that you know how was that for you and they're bringing their curiosity and their compassion i you know I'm in a position now where I, I'm not so defensive. I don't need to prove something to them because they're already right there. So I just say, well, first of all, thank you. And second of all, 
here's how it was for me and here's my request and they are listening. And so, you know, you just move very quickly through those. Beautiful. Yeah. I think that re-owning, that's such an important part of the process of resolving this kind of tensions. That's beautiful what you just said. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. It's responsibility. Right. (laughs) Right. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, so very, very simple. Uh, but I, I loved what you said about this, um, you know, opening out uh, that we have disowned parts of ourselves, uh, which deity practice is also very good for because some of the deities are very uh, funky looking. You know, they've got big eye teeth, they've got fl- hairs and flames and, uh, you know, bulging eyes. They are not, you know, your typical pleasant uh, idea of a deity. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they are fierce. Uh, They're called wrathful, but I think of them as fierce. Um, And sometimes you need fierce. These are still enlightened beings who are motivated purely by compassion. Um, And so this is how we can begin to open up to some pretty funky parts of ourselves that haven't gotten a chance to be developed to the point where they can serve us. So in a way, it's like we're not playing with a full deck. <laughs> we yeah, don't right. Play parts of ourselves, and uh, I mean, some people would refer to that's kind of an idiom in English for describing somebody who's kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. They're not playing with a full deck. <laughs> mm-hmm. So right. now begin to elevate and own these parts of ourselves then they can be in service to the our self capital s the larger self which Mm. includes us but uh it's all on everyone as we um go along the path that's beautiful because that's also beautiful like maybe tibetan application of shadow work because it helps us actually to get to the suppressed stuff in us that otherwise plays out in a different way and helps us to activate and re-own it and even connect it to higher enlightened qualities. So that's actually a beautiful way to do that shadow work that many people are doing in other ways too, but I think that's a very powerful way to activate those energies in us consciously. Yeah, I think both and uh, as a, you know, former practicing psychotherapist uh, with a Jungian emphasis, so, you know, archetypes, um, and now practicing these practices, I would say there's a place for both. Mm -hmm. And the way I think of it is that uh, we're trapped in a dark attic with the furniture piled up all over the place and we're crashing into it all the time. You know, that's our mental state, (laughs) you know, when we start working on ourselves. And then we get a headlamp and that's psychotherapy. And we can begin to look here and there and begin to rearrange the furniture so we're not tripping all over it. Um, But then, you know, these spiritual practices show us the doorway out. So we're not stuck in an attic all the time at all. We can go in and out if we want. (laughs) Mm, That's beautiful. I think that's a great way to leave everybody in that space. Yes. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Mm, And you very much. So thank you. And I hope it's part of more conversations to come. Me too. Mm. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel. Stay connected and get updates about new episodes by visiting our website, pointofrelationpodcast.com, and by subscribing to the Thomas Hubel YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share about us with your community on social media. Thank you. We appreciate your support.